here, well, what, uh, what happened the week before the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Well, we want to look at some of those things this morning. Can't look at every aspect of it, but I want to uh, just preach this morning a message on a passion of obedience. A passion of obedience. And this has to deal with the triumphal, the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ the week before uh, He was crucified. Uh, we also find a quote, we'll see this later, I know at uh, Tabernacle Baptist Church on White Horse Road, Dr. Harold B. Seidler, uh, on his pulpit, which I've stood behind uh, years and years ago, he's got a plaque there that says, Sirs, we would see Jesus. So anytime anybody preaches there, uh, they see that, that plaque, Sir, uh, we would see Jesus. And I always thought, and thought that would be a, a, a beautiful thing for any uh, preacher to have. I thought about even doing it here because every time you see that, uh, you want the Lord Jesus Christ to be glorified. Matthew chapter 21, uh, we'll, we'll get there in just a few moments, but in the book of John, the Bible talks about Jesus uh, was at Bethany. Bethany was where the house of Mary and Martha was. Jesus, I believe, probably spent a lot of time there. That was a probably a, 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 time, a refuge for him, and we'll see this even in the book of John. But the, the week prior to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, being crucified, Christ has performed all kinds of miracles, a lot of things are going on, and you have to understand the the Roman Empire there. These uh, these people were under the subject of the Romans, and, and a lot of people thought Christ was going to be their king. They honestly thought Christ was going to be the one to come up, and uh, they were looking for a king to come up and overthrow uh, the Romans. And they really, a lot of people thought Christ was that person. And we want to look at this this morning. Now, this account is given in every gospel. That really amazes me. When you're doing Bible study, I mentioned uh, Thursday night about Bible study. Uh, when you find something that's mentioned in all four gospels, uh, that's just significant in my mind. A lot of things are only mentioned once. And in some books of the Bible, Matthew was a book was written to the Jews. Remember that, and we'll see this this morning. Gen uh, uh, Matthew chapter 21, let's look at the first uh, 16 verses. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied in a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say unto you, You shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. Now I want you to see something interesting about all four of these accounts. Uh, we're given where disciples are sent and they, they're obedient. And that's, that's what we're going to be dealing with this morning, a passion of obedience. The Bible says in verse 4, And all this was done that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. I don't know if you noticed any of the songs that we mentioned or sang this morning, but every one of those songs somewhere had something about the king, our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope you'll, you'll always reflect it on some of those songs. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek or in mercy, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the fall of an ass. And the disciples went and did as the disciples commanded them. See, true disciples are obedient. That's what we want to be this morning. True disciples are obedient. And brought the ass, and they called and put them on their clothes, and they set them their own. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed, saying, crying, Hosanna to the Son of God, or David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Or save us. That word, and we'll see that later in another gospel. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Notice that. Who is this? They asked. And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. This was a, a time of the Passover. A lot of people were in Jerusalem. Uh, people would come and they were buying uh, animals to do sacrifices as, as the Lord had commanded. And a lot of people were taking advantage of that and one of the first things he did was come in and basically cleanse the temple. Now, I'm going to show you something in just a moment. I, I never had really, I guess I, I saw this. I never really put it two and two together. 
But in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and we'll see this in the Gospel of John, Jesus did the exact same thing. He came in and he threw out the money changers and he cleansed the temple. At the very two or three days before Jesus was crucified, he did the exact same thing. He cleansed the temple. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I just believe the temple, the church today, uh, especially the New Testament, uh, I believe God wants us clean, folks. I, I believe cleanliness uh, brings revival. It brings a greater love for thee. And the Bible says he overthrew the tables of the money changers. Uh, me and Kenneth were talking about this morning for church or for Sunday school home about uh, Jesus Christ uh, being a very, I believe, a very masculine, masculine man, a uh, very uh, muscular man. Kind of like me. No, not really. Uh, he, I believe uh, Jesus Christ was very built. And there was not very many men that really uh, would have taken him on one-on-one. -on -one. And I see that actually in many parts of the scripture where uh, they always seemed to come up on him with, with several people. It was never one person uh, just approached the Lord, if you notice that. And uh, he comes in there and the Bible says he overthrew the tables of the money changers. He didn't just come in and ask them, would you guys please leave? No, he didn't do that. He turned the tables upside down and said, get out of here. He says, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna, the word save us, to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Wow, that's interesting to me. Here's these priests and the scribes. They, they didn't like that too much. You know why they didn't like that? Because they were religious. They were, they were entrenched in the traditions. I want you to hold your thoughts there and go over to Luke. Or excuse me, let's go to Mark chapter 11. I tried to set it up where it was right in your New Testament. You just turn a few pages. I started to go backwards. I started starting John to go backwards to Matthew because uh, you can do it either way and it really has the same effect. But in Matthew, or Mark chapter 11, and let's look at the first couple of verses here. And when they came to Jerusalem in the Bethage, in Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples. Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, wherein never a man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Say ye, to that, say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and then straightway he will send him thither. You know, an interesting, another interesting thought about this, and I really, really thought much about it even this past week. Uh, this animal that was tied up, obviously, the Lord knew, I believe, knew this individual that probably owned these animals. Uh, an interesting thing because all four Gospels give an account, say, well, look, uh, uh, you know, if you just walked up to somebody's yard and, and untied their, you know, their animal and started walking away with a horse or a donkey or whatever, they would go, hey, hey, buddy, where are you going? What are you doing? Well, the Lord have need of him. Oh, okay, that's no problem. Uh, go, help yourself. Uh, have a great day. Uh, you know, that's kind of the connotation, but uh, all four Gospels record that little incident. Now, you say, well, what, what is so significant about all of this? Well, first of all, he says in verse 4, and they went their way and found the colt. In other words, every time we're given the Gospel, Christ tells these men to do this, they just obey. They didn't question it. They didn't sit around and pray about it. They didn't discuss it. They just did it. And they took care of it. The Bible says they went with the door without in a place where two ways met and they loose him. And certain of them stood by and said, Hey, what do you what do ye loosen your coal? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the coal to Jesus and cast their garments on him. And he sat upon him. And many spread their garments. So these people are spreading part of their clothing. They're cutting down palm tree limbs. They're cutting down brush or some, And they're laying it in front of this animal. And the Lord Jesus Christ is walking into Jerusalem. And the Bible says they're, they're, they're singing, uh, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the land. They honestly, so many people thought, this is it. This is our king that's going to save us. They didn't realize that he was the king. They really wanted to save them from their sin. But that, wasn't, that really wasn't where they were going. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the Bible says he entered into Jerusalem. He looks around upon all things. And now the eventide was coming. He went out to Bethany 
with the twelve. Now, what's he saying here? He comes to Jerusalem, and you have to understand this. He is carrying the burden of his soul here because he recognizes, I must go to Jerusalem. The Passover is in. And he recognizes in just a few days, and I'm talking just two or three days, our Savior, our King, will be on a cross of Calvary. And that's, that's on his mind. He already knows this. He already knows what's going to transpire. He understands the agony and the beating and the spit and the shame and the brutal uh, you know, thrashing that his body is going to take. If you will, go up to Luke chapter 19. Now Luke, obviously, we know Luke as a physician, as a doctor. And let's look at this. And I hope you'll see something even greater here in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, let's start reading with verse 28. The Bible says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, sending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass that he came to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village, over against you, in the which you are entering, you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never a man sat. Loose him and bring him thither. Notice that. Never a man sat. I'm reminded in the film Sheffy. I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, the film Sheffy. Uh, Sheffy is a, a circuit riding preacher. And he gives his horse. He travels ever by horse. And he gives his horse to this needy family. And he walks in this little town. And it just so happens that that particular day that they were having a big auction of horses. What a, what a coincidence, right? And he gets there and uh, all these men say, hey, we need, to, we need to buy the preacher here a horse. And so they, they, they need this horse. He comes out and, and uh, they buy the preacher a horse and he gets a saddle. He said, well, wait, wait a minute. These horses have never been ridden before. These horses have never been broken before. You don't, you don't just walk over and get on a horse. But Sheffy did. If you read the story, it's amazing. He really goes over there and he talks to the horse. I think he named his, I don't know if he named the new horse uh, Gideon or not, but I know his, his horse was named Gideon. And he, see, he puts a saddle on him and he rides off into the wilderness. You say, wow, that's a, here the Bible says this animal, never a man sat on him. Look what he says down here. It's a, an interesting thing here. He says, why do you lose him? Because the Lord hath need of him. And they were the sin went their way and found even as he said unto them as they were loosing the colt. The owner said, why lose ye the colt? And they said, the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the cold. And they said, Jesus, thereupon, in other words, they were acknowledging Jesus Christ as king. They, they recognized that. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you really recognize him? We sang those songs this morning. Praise him, praise him. And some of those verses talk about our king. Uh, you know, people talk about it in the Old Testament. Uh, Israel came to the Lord and said, Lord, we want a king just like these other countries. We want a king. And the Lord was saying, I'm your king. I want to be your king. I want to protect you. I want to provide for you. And the people said, no, 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 we understand that, but we, we want a king. And they, they went, finally, we understand where Saul was appointed as king. That really wasn't God's choice. That was, that was a people's choice, but God, God allowed that, and unfortunately it caused a lot of problems. And look what he says in verse 36, or excuse me, verse 37. And when it was come nigh, even to the sin of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice, and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to, the, said to him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Or in other words, hey, you don't, why, why, don't, don't be so spiritual. Why, what's the problem here? And Jesus says, and I love this verse, he said, I'll tell you that. If these should hold their peace, even the stones around here would cry out. Wow, that's amazing to me. I'm not going to tell them to, to be quiet. Hey, these people were looking for a king to overthrow their own. Now, there, were, there, was, uh, there was true disciples here, and obviously there was false disciples in the same crowd. There were was, there was disciples of Christ. They understood what was going on, but there, was, there were disciples. They were false. They were in the crowd. They were the, it was a, here was the Pharisees. Uh, Master, rebuke thy disciples. No, I can't do that. And when he was come near, verse 41, he beheld the city and he wept over it. So Luke gives us a little more detail. Then I want you to go over to John chapter 12. 
Now, I understand we've been in three Gospels really quick this morning. And I hope that you can kind of, uh, kind of keep all three of those Gospel accounts, everything that we've just read, and then we want to go to John chapter 12. The Bible says, uh, John chapter 12, verse 1, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, which where Lazarus was, which he'd been dead, to be raised from the dead. In other words, Bethany was a, had to be a place where Christ visited many times. It was where Mary and Martha, we understand the story here in verse 2, that he made him a supper. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. And here's Mary, bless her heart. She takes a, 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 a pound of ointment, spiders, very costly, very precious, and she comes in and she breaks that thing open. This was usually used after a person had died. It was like an embalming uh, fluid. It was a very uh, fragrance there, and it, it, uh, it kept back the, uh, the smell of death and that, that awfulness of death. And she anoints the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, and she wipes his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of this ointment. And some of the disciples said, you know, she, she shouldn't have done all that. We, we've heard many messages on that. We won't get that so much this morning, but notice what he says in verse 5. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And they go through this little thing and uh, let her alone for she, she understands that, uh, she understands what's coming. Mary understands that I'm going to die very soon. Drop down to verse 12. And on the next day, many people, much people that were coming to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereupon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass that's called. These things understood not the disciples at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees also said among themselves, Perceive ye how you prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. And all these people, these final verses here, talks about it, even, even in this thing, is a, you know, here is Christ desiring to teach and he, he gives us uh, this uh, parable about the, the weed the corn of the weed falls to the ground and it's got to die. Now what's he saying here? John chapter 2 remember hold your place right there and you're in John 11 John chapter 2 let me just show you this right fast I saw this again this week I, I really saw it really for the first time in a great way in John chapter 2 look at verse 15 or excuse me let's just start reading with verse 13 John 2 13 and the Jews Passover was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money city. And when he had made a scourge of small cork, did you get that? that was, that's what the Lord did. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did on this occasion. The Bible says, this is, now understand, this is, this is at the beginning of his earthly ministry. Jesus Christ was about 30, 30 years of age here. And the Bible says he made a scourge of small cords. He drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers and overthrew the table. In other words, at the beginning of his ministry, he literally made a whip and he, clear, he cleansed the temple. At the end of his ministry, the Bible says, he went into the temple and he did the exact same thing. And that's what he says there. The Bible talks about verses 12 through 19 here, these verses that Jesus went in and he just he, he disrupted the temple there. Now, what am I saying this morning? This was the week before we know as Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday. And you know, you as a Christian really ought to get used to saying Resurrection Sunday instead of Easter. Easter Sunday's fine, but I love the term Resurrection Sunday. You know why? Because that's what it was. Hey, our, 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 our faith, and we'll say a lot more about that next Sunday, because I, I tell you what, for a preacher, uh, there's a few days in the, in, the, in the year that I just love, and one of them is Resurrection Sunday, because he, he rose from the dead. That's exciting for the child of God. For the liberal, they have a lot of problem with that. But look what the Bible says, and we're going to look at this this morning. From these four aspects, Christ was obedient to the Father. I must needs go to Jerusalem. 
But likewise, on every occasion, he said, hey, I want you to go to this place. There's going to be an animal there. And you, you get the animal and you bring him here. Hey, where are you going with my animal? Well, the Lord hath need of him. Okay. And he may bring him back and fall four gospels give an account of how the Lord Jesus Christ gets on that animal and he comes into Jerusalem and so many people are so excited they're throwing garments down, they're taking palm tree limbs, they're cutting down whatever, and they're putting it down in front of, it, of that donkey. And as Christ is sitting there that nobody's ever sat on, by the way, and I don't believe the donkey bugged them off. It was probably a perfect, a perfect ride as much as it could have been. And all of a sudden, those very people, folks, that hollered out Hosanna, the king of Israel, just Two or three days later would be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Think about that a minute. Jesus Christ, hearing those very words, and I thought about that even this morning. I got up early and I read that verse again in verse 13. That they cried, blessed is the king of Israel. Even as our Savior, the king, heard those very words, in the back of his mind, he knew that just in a few days, they would be saying, Crucify. Crucify. Think about that, man. What in the world was Christ thinking when he heard us? And I have to wonder. Yes, he was 100% God, but he was 100% man. As 100% man, if, you're, if, you, if you had the foreknowledge of, of somebody giving you praise, knowing that just the next breath they were going to be stabbing you in the back with a knife. You ever thought about that? That's what our Savior was facing. Now, the obedience... Of all these disciples are listed in all four Gospels. A passion for obedience. And I hope to this morning that that's your desire to have a passion to just be obedient. You know what? I, I, I say this many times to people. If you would just obey the Word of God and you would follow the Word of God, life would flow. You know what I mean by that? It flows like a river. I've got peace like a river. You know, we sing these little courses, something that's really good. But you know how a river flows? Right below our house in Piedmont is a saluta. And when you go on by the, you know, you can, you can actually sit there on the bank and fish, and you really can't hardly even see that water flowing. You know it's flowing, but you can't hardly tell it's even moving. Now, after a big rain, yeah, you can really see it. You've been downtown Greenwood after a big rain. Well, you know it comes through there. You know it comes over the falls there. And then you got those nuts that get out there in them kayaks and ride that ride those things. I'm thinking. Man, those guys got way too much free time. But they, they do it and they, they enjoy it. I guess they, they know what they're doing. I hope they do. But you know how a river flows? You know what? When you obey the Word of God and you're obedient, guess what? That's what happens. You flows. But when you start disobeying, guess what? Oh, man, what was that? That's a rock. There's, a, there's, there's the logs there. And you start hitting boulders. I remember the only year that I attended the wilds as a teenager. Our cabin went tubing down. There's a river down at the bottom part of that mountain. We hiked down there. And the night before, it rained all night. I mean, it rained. And we, and we got our inner tubes, and we're, we're downstream, and we're walking upstream, and we're looking at the river. And I mean, this river is raging. There's boulders in that river bigger than this church building. Uh, you know, staggering. I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, how am I going to do that? You know, I'm going to do it. And I remember thinking, walking up, boy, if my mom knew I was getting ready to do this, there's no way she did, but she's not here, and I'm probably not going to tell her until many years down the road, and, and she won't know, and everything will be okay. And I remember walking up there, and here I was, a, a junior in high school. I mean, <clears throat> boy, I wasn't too scared of too much. I'm thinking, I ain't sure I want to go down this river. But, you know, I was under peer pressure, right? I mean, I had a bunch of, I had a bunch of, like, oh, man, this is going to be great. Come on, what is it? I'm thinking, yeah, man, this is going to be really big, great. And in my heart, I'm thinking, oh, Lord, please, please don't let me drown. Please don't let me I'll fall off this right. But, you know, I was walking up that, going up that top of that mountain, and I remember getting out, and all of a sudden, man, I mean, we, here we go. You know, it was going, we were going so fast that before we realized it, we were in the lake. Hey, man, that was great. Let's do that again. And here we go. We walk over, and we do it. We did it several times. Now, the first time I walked up there and I saw all them boulders, I didn't, I didn't think I wanted to ride that. You know what, folks? The Christian life, if we're in disobedience, many times we're, we're going to be hitting those things. We're going to be getting snags there. Now, all four Gospels, and especially in chapter 6, or excuse me, chapter 12 of John, the Bible says six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany. Can you imagine what Jesus Christ was thinking? He says, you know what? In just a few days, 
I'm going to the cross. I'm going to shed my blood for all mankind. I'm going to suffer shame. I'm going to show her agony. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer the crown of thorns on my head. I'm going to be beat like honestly. When they get through me, I'm going to look worse than a, probably a piece of amber meat. You're not going to be able to recognize me. It is going to be an awful thing. The pain is going to be awful. And he's thinking all this in his mind. He comes into Jerusalem, and all these people are saying, "Woo! What do is all this said, Hosanna! You're the king!" Blah blah blah. And in his heart, he's thinking, "You don't mean it." You don't really love that. You don't, you don't mean that because just in a few hours, just in a few hours, a few days. Now, we can sit here this morning and argue what day of the week the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on. I got my own personal opinion. If you want to talk to me later, that's fine. If you figure three days and three days in the tomb as the Bible displays, and I understand the Jewish day starts at a certain time and you have to figure that in. But a lot of, a lot of times people, people will say that they celebrate Good Friday. And I've often wondered, wow, when you think about Good Friday, the only good part about that Friday was that, that Jesus Christ went to the cross on Calvary, whether it was Friday or Thursday or Wednesday evening or Wednesday middle of the day, and I'll, I'll get you to start thinking as far as, it, it really doesn't matter so much when Jesus Christ went to the cross and what hour, the exact time, but I'll tell you this, do you know that He went to the cross for your sin? Has there ever been a time in your life when you recognize He died for me? Hey, I want you to go to Philippians chapter 2. This is where we're going to end this morning. I hope that you will you will, you will take all four Gospels. I, and I trust this week sometime, as you think about the Easter story, the resurrection story, the going to the Calvary, that uh, every day you'll, you'll take some time and just, just read those chapters in the Gospels and meditate on the, those passages. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. Let's start reading with verse... Uh, let's, uh, let's start about verse 5. It, what a tremendous book, the book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. I read that verse now for this reason. When Christ was coming into Jerusalem on that donkey, uh, all these people were all just in awe and throwing all this stuff in front of him, uh, acting like, yes, I'm, I'm the king that's going to uh, save, save us from, from this, uh, this uh, Roman, uh, you know, battle and slavery, so to speak. He says there, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God. Notice that. Not necessarily a shape there, but I believe in the essence of the Godhead, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. That word speaks of humility. Humility. I used to work with a fellow that he was a... Uh, he was a church of God, something, and they had they had they had foot washings in their church. And I've, I've said I've said many times, I think you ought to wash your feet. I'm doing do it in church, but you know, wash your feet before you come here. Amen. That'd be great. I'm sure everybody around you would appreciate you doing that. But I, I said, how do you do that? And we we just you know he just he just he just told me. I said, I understand why you think that's part of a ordinance, but I said you know that 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 kind of gets down. And he and he he basically said, well, it's just being a servant. It's showing humility. And I understand where, where people about, take that as one of the ordinance. But he said, they form of a servant and was made the likeness of being and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient. And there's that word obedient right there, unto death. Even the death of the cross. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus was obedient. To, you know, I thought about him being 100% man. But 100% God, what if he came to that point and said, you know what, I don't think I can do this. I've changed my mind. Have you ever done that on anything? You decide to do something? Maybe some of you young people, you went to a, maybe you went to an amusement park and you're with a bunch of friends. Oh, let's go ride, let's go ride so-and-so. And you get up there and you realize, I don't think I want to ride that ride. If I ride that ride, I'm going to get sick. And I'm going to be sick the rest of the night. I think I better just sit up here as I did many years ago. And, and oh, come on, come on, it'd be okay. And I, and I knew I was going to get sick. I knew it. But because of peer pressure, I rode that thing. And, oh, man, I wish I hadn't rode that thing. That's the worst thing I've ever done in my life. And it just ruined my... Now, thankfully, it was kind of toward the end of the day, and I, I enjoyed the rest of the day. But the rest of that day, I didn't enjoy it too much. You know why? Because I knew something was going to hurt me. Notice what he says here. He says, Obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. And I love this. Giving him a name 
which is above every name. Have you ever meditated on the names of the Lord Jesus Christ? There is a name. I love to hear. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Well, I'll tell you one thing. There, there's going to come a day where every person that's never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they will bow the knee. They will understand exactly that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. There will be a universal acknowledgement of who Christ really is. There will be a universal worship. He says, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of aspects about a name. Uh, my, my, my name, when my mom and dad named me, they named me Joseph. Joseph Stuart Willis. Joseph. Well, I didn't know what Joseph meant for the longest time. And I, read, I found out a long time ago, it, mean, it means in the Hebrew just to add. And I thought about that. I thought, well, what does that mean? To add. To add what? Well, when you think about Joseph in the Bible, think about who he added. Think about it. Hey, his family rejected him. His brother sold him into slavery. He winds up in Potiphar's house. He's, uh, he's falsely accused. He winds up in prison for two years. And we know the story. The butler and the baker come down there and give him a little story, you know. And he said, well, you know, hey, man, it's okay. Two, three days, you're, you're going back in the palace. And you're, going, you're going to serve the Lord, man. You're going to be in your... And the other guy, oh, that sounds great. Well, what's going to happen to me? He said, well, in two, three days, you're going to die, man. Sorry, but you're, you're finished. You, 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 uh, you, you missed uh, did the, the kingdom. And then Joseph slowly is promoted... And the Bible says that there's going to come a famine in Egypt. And he tells Pharaoh that he says, for seven years, we're going, to, we're going to have all the corn we can grow. And then for seven years, we're going to have zero. For seven years, we're going to have all this water. And then for the next seven years, we're going to have zero. What are we going to do? And Pharaoh says to Joseph, oh, that I could find somebody that could take care of this problem. And guess who he picks? Joseph. You're the man. Me? Oh, Pharaoh, I appreciate your confidence in me, Pharaoh, but really, um, you think Joseph did that? No, I don't think he did. I believe God already spent, had already showed Joseph, this is what you got to do. you got to build these reservoirs of whole water, and you got to store grain. And Joseph, he, he went to it. Hey, by the way, Joseph had plenty of help. I mean, he had plenty of, he had plenty of, real, he said, hey, I need, I need, you know, 5,000 people. Uh, what, it didn't matter what it cost. Pharaoh said, you do it. Here's your checkbook. You go do it. And be hasty about it. We've we, we, so we got seven years to prepare. Joseph, to add. Names mean something. And the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ, he said that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, I like that. To the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved. That speaks to Christians there. As ye have always, and there's that word again, obeyed. What if the disciples would have said, why, why are we going to, to get this donkey? I'm kind of hungry. Let's go, let's go get something to eat. Let's go down to Jack and Bob and get something to eat. Now you have to read in the Hebrew that. Uh, let's, go get, let's go do something else. No, they obeyed. Maybe they didn't understand what, what he was doing. They just obeyed. Young people, adults, when God asks us to do something from his word, you know what we do? We just obey. Now you may not understand everything. Uh, God asks you to do something. But I promise you this. If God asks you to do something... He's got a reason for it. And I, I tell you something else. If he asks you to do something from his work, he's going to give you the strength to do it. He's not going to ask you to go climb into a, a, a cockpit of F-16 fighter jet. Amen? He's not going to ask you to do that. I kind of like to do that sometimes. Right? I'd like to ride with a guy. At least I think I would. Probably once I get on the runway, I'd be one of them times and say, hey, buddy, I, I changed my mind. Can we? No, nope, we ain't going back. Yeah. I, I thought that'd be kind of a neat thing. But you know what? They obey. Not in my presence only. I love that. But now much more in my absence. Boy, I started meditating on it. I said, Lord, you've been gone from this earth a long time. And Lord, I want to obey you. I want to obey you just like you were sitting right up here in our service today. Have you ever thought about the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on the front pew during one of our services? By the way, he is. He's there in spirit. He's not there bodily, but he's there in spirit. That's why... In my own heart, everything that goes on in church, everything that goes on in the sanctuary, I'm always conscious the Lord is sitting there. Well, what's the Lord think about that? Man, that, that's an indictment on a lot of places because I've been in places where, oh man, I tell you what, the, the devil, 
The devil was sitting on the, the Lord. The Lord has been long kicked off the front pew. He's not even in the church, but the devil's sitting there and he's having a good old time. He says, you have obeyed not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God, and I know that, which worketh you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Hey, can I say this this morning in closing? It is God's good pleasure that we recognize Him as King this morning. Hey, as Jesus Christ walked in on that donkey or sat in and He rode in and all those people were all excited and they was crying, Oh, great are you, you're King. And Hosanna, Hosanna. And they were probably doing their, their hands and all, all just big, uh, just a big whoop lover. You know what Christ said in His heart? He's saying, Why do you do these things? Why are you saying these things? Because in two or three days, you're going to say, Crucify Him. And I'll be on the cross. But I oh, thank God, as we'll see next week, thank God, even though they put Him on the cross, and even though they put Him in the tomb, thank God He didn't stay there. Because the first two or three days, the devil came, and he said, hey, I still got Him, I still got Him, but the third day, the demons of hell said, hey, hey, Satan, something's, something's happening in the tomb, I can't, we can't hold Him. He said, you're not going to hold Him, Mike, because He came forth. He came forth victorious, and we'll, we'll deal with that next week. But I'm going to close with this verse. The Bible says in verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among ye shine as lights in the world. Hey, you know what? That's all God wants us to be, folks. He wants to be a, shy, a shining light. And you know what I'm talking about. I, I shared with you the other night about the uh, working out there on my AC unit. I had that flashlight. Years ago, uh, we were, we were, Kenneth was in Cub Scouts, and we were up at Kings Mountain, North Carolina, and we had to, we had to take flashlights. And we marched a good ways. And then what the, what the scoutmaster was uh, was doing at the Battle of Kings Mountain, there was what the mountain men. They were somewhere. I don't know where they were. They, were, they, they knew the revolution and the British were coming. And they marched all night. No lights. No nothing. They didn't have flashlights. We had flashlights. But no lights. No talking. No nothing. And they marched about, what was it, about 30-something miles? 30-something miles. No talking. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine guys walking 30 miles and not being able to say anything, but that, that's the way it was. It had to be total quiet, marching, and they won a decisive victory. Why? Because they did not show their presence to the enemy. There was no lights. There was no, no talking, nothing. And when the British came through that point, that was not a good day for the British. It was a good day for the mountain men. And the Battle of Kings Mountain stands today. If you ever get up there, you go to that park, you'll see a video that I encourage you to go up there one Saturday. Uh, you, your parents want some, somewhere to take a young person up there for a day. That, that's, that, that's a great thing. You get Walk around there and you see all that. But what am I saying? You know what? A crooked and perverse nation. Folks, tonight, we, we live in a place that is just incredible today. People, they don't care about the Lord. They don't care about this Bible. He said, how do you know they don't care about this Bible? Well, one reason they've written too many, too many editions of it. They, they're changing it too much. And they're probably going to change it again within another two or three years. Uh, you know, we I walk in a Christian bookstore, and my blood almost, my blood almost, I look, I look on the wall there, and I'm thinking, oh man, you know, what, what is that all about? Why are they doing that? Why don't they just stick to something that God's preserved all these years and protected us, and where revival has come out of, and many souls have been saved, and churches have flourished, and they want to bring something that's fake and counterfeit, and the $3 bill. I don't want to do that. I've shared many, many times. A good friend of mine worked in the bank. And I often say, how, how, do you, how do you know counterfeit? She says, because you handle the real stuff so much. Amen? You handle, the, you handle the stuff so much that when a counterfeit comes along, it bites you. It grabs your hand. And, and she's sitting there, and a, this lady passed her a counterfeit bill. Boom, she knew automatically. Uh-oh, we got a problem. Bring the alarm. Step on the alarm, however they do it. They got two or three buttons that they can, they can do. If a bank robbery, you know, it's amazing. Why? Counterfeit. That's what Satan does, folks. And when Jesus walked into Jerusalem and he disrupted that temple and he cleansed that temple, he did the beginning of his ministry. He did the end of his ministry. What was he saying to us today? Be clean, church. Because one day I'm coming soon. We don't know that day. It may be today, it may be tonight. We may not see it tomorrow morning. And if we don't, that's okay. But if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you don't want that day to come. God's merciful. Let's all stand this morning. Every head by every eye closed this morning. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian,
Can I say something to you particularly this morning? When Jesus was on that donkey walking in Jerusalem, He had His face like a flint headed toward Calvary. He understood exactly what He was about to do. The Bible says he, he did that for you. He did it for your sin and my sin and for the sin of mankind. He went to the cross. He shed His blood. That was unique blood, by the way. The only blood ever in the world that could have redeemed mankind. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. If you're here this morning, you don't know Him as personal Lord and Savior, don't go another day. Don't go another day living like that. Hey, you can know. The Bible says we can know. That we know, we, we know what Christ did. We can know we're on the way to heaven. We can know why. You say, preacher, I'm here today. You know, maybe I was, maybe I'm like one of those people that said, Hosanna. And two or three days later, I was one of those that crucified him. Crucified him. If you're here this morning and there's something in your life that's not right with God, leave it at an altar. Come to an old-fashioned altar and say, Lord, I know I'm not where I need to be, but thank God for the blood. I want to leave here. I want to leave it at this altar. I want to walk out of here clean, refreshed, and I want to serve you. Oh, praise God. As we think about this week, the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it was. But at the same time, it was very sad because Christ knew. Christ was on His way to the, on the way cross. And what he would go through for your sin and my sin is incredible. So many people today just reject it. I trust you'll meditate that even the same way. Hey, hey.